know a little bit about it. 67.
just joining us, well, welcome. Why don't you comment below? Tell us your hot drink of choice this morning. Do you drink hot? You guys all drink hot drinks, eh? Coffee. If you're like Adam, my brother, you don't drink hot drinks. That's weird. Don't know how you have children and not drink coffee. Yeah. What's that? Um, we're going to keep singing.
Lord, we say that we put our trust in You, that You are able to do everything we need. You are able to provide everything we need. You're more than enough for us. And so we, we implore You to remind us of the strength that You give us. Kia kaha, kia maia, kia mano anui. Be strong, be steadfast. Father, may our hearts be willing. In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to head to Chris now. He's going to tell us a few things about what's going on. Well, hey, good morning, MCC. It is so good to be with you here this morning. Uh, If you are watching us uh, with your house church group, we want to welcome you. Uh, we want to say again, Alana's mentioned it a couple times, but uh, we want to know that you're watching, so comment below. Uh, if you are new and catching us for the first time, please comment new below and we will be uh, in touch with you. Hey, we've got a big week coming up, a uh, big announcement tomorrow, and you know what? It looks like that next week we are going to be back in this building uh, worshiping as a church family again together. Um, And so we're really looking forward to that. Uh, But I want to let you know, too, that we've heard from a lot of you that uh, you've really enjoyed being with these smaller groups in these uh, house churches and uh, being able to to talk and and just bounce things off each other and pray in smaller groups and that it's been a really fruitful time for a lot of you. And so um, we are going to uh, look at what that looks like moving forward. What does it look like to maintain Uh, some of that uh, intimacy that a lot of you have have talked about enjoying so much. And so um, watch this space. We will uh, be be telling you um, some things that we have planned uh, in the next couple weeks and how we are going to uh, move forward as a church. But but for now, uh, all things, you know, hopefully with the announcement tomorrow, we will be back in this space uh, next week. And so we really look forward to that, and it's going to be a special Sunday. Uh, it's going to have a, a celebratory fill, and we just really would invite you to join us uh, in that. Um, with that, let me just um, pray for the rest of our worship, and then we will go back to uh, Alana and the rest of the team. So, Father, thank you for being in this space. We look forward to being able to worship uh, with all of us together. There's something special about all of our voices being raised uh, in praise to you. And so uh, we look forward to being back together as a church family next week in this space, but we also thank you for what you've done uh, in our midst during this, this difficult time. We thank you for uh, the way that we will change moving forward as a church and for the growth that we've seen in our own lives and in the lives of others around us. So Father, we just um, we praise you, we thank you for the opportunity uh, that we have had to still maintain contact, and we look forward to... Uh, what that looks like in the future. So be with us this day. Uh, I pray that this will be uh, pleasing to you the rest of the service and that you will just go before us in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so back to Alana and the rest of the team and we'll um, sing some more songs. I was just reading the live feed and a bunch of you don't like coffee. I just, I know, it's very impressive. I wish I had an intravenous yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, we're super excited. Hopefully the announcement tomorrow says that we're allowed to meet together. Um, I do want to reassure you, though, that we will make sure that um, our gathering is live streamed for those of you whose only method of watching us is uh, via your phone or TV. Um, but we're going to work out the finer details of that as we go along. But we really have appreciated this journey and doing it together um, while separately, which is sort of like every introvert, intra, introvert's dream. Is it Anthony? Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll live stream Anthony and playing drums from our house. Um, and then he wouldn't be as loud in the building. I'm digressing. We're going to continue to worship, but we are, we are really glad that you're here. And one of the things that makes us messy is just our ability to laugh at each other, I suppose. With each other? What's the... At, at, at each other. Um, but we're going to sing a, a couple more songs. We're going to worship together. And um, I was having an interesting conversation with a friend about um, meditation and the idea of centering yourself. And, um, and that's what worship does for me. When I sing about God and I sing about the greatness of God, 
and the fact that God is the only one that can provide what we need, that is that centering for me. That is that ability to to not block everything else out, but to recognize the gravity and the bigness of God and what he did for us. So I hope that during these songs, you're able to feel that sense of, um, that sense of groundedness that, that we, we don't have to fear and that we can be at peace because of what God did for us.
your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you our Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name
He is Lord. He is risen above the grave. He is risen above every circumstance. And um, I hope you feel the sense of hopefulness this morning um, as we go back to Chris, who is going to share with us this morning, um, continuing our Without Wall series. Well, hey, just want to take a, a minute and let you know that there are, uh, there's a Thrive video. So um, if you are in a situation where you've got some kids in your house and, and um, they're going to look at some, some stuff for Thrive, now would be a great time for you to uh, make that transition. Uh, I'm also going to just acknowledge that we uh, very much appreciate the continued faithfulness of uh, your gifts. Uh, many of you are on automatic payment, and we appreciate you continuing that, uh, especially during this time. And so I want to acknowledge that. I want to acknowledge the, the many gifts that God has, has given this church in talent and uh, in time, uh, as well as financial resources. Uh, thank you for your commitment and dedication to the food bank and for uh, the help fund that uh, was, was quite successful as far as uh, being able to, to help people. And so we just want to thank you for that. Uh, we want to we want to acknowledge that um, this is a really generous church and generous people, and so um, let me just pray for for our offering and uh, for our continued uh, heart of generosity here in this place. Father, we thank you for the good gifts that you've given your people. Uh, we thank you for so many that have uh, right priorities, uh, who want to give uh, because you have so richly blessed them. I pray that uh, the, the church and the leadership here will continue to uh, be faithful stewards of the gifts that you've given. Uh, I pray that we will continue to use those to uh, help people and to expand your kingdom. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, uh, we are in the third week of the series uh, Without Walls. And if you've been around the last two weeks, uh, our, our theme sort of in this series has been uh, how do we approach church when we are outside of these walls? Now, ironically, for the last couple of weeks, we've been back inside these walls, and we will continue that uh, probably next week where we'll be able to gather all together. But uh, one of the things that I think we've all learned through this time is that the church is uh, more than just this building. And so, really, that was the theme for the first week, is that the church is people. And uh, we are meant to be together as a, as a body. We are meant to do life together. And so, you are a piece of a puzzle. And whether that puzzle is uh, a big puzzle or a medium-sized puzzle or a large puzzle, everyone has a gift and everyone is meant to be in community and in, in life with each other in the church. And so uh, we talked about that the first week, about the importance of being together. And uh, whether that's gathering in a, in a house or in a church building or even outside in a field, God's people were meant to be together. And then last week we talked about the idea of the gospel and how uh, the gospel is meant to be preached to ourselves each and every day. Uh, oftentimes we have this idea that the gospel, and, and this is subconscious for a lot of us, that the gospel is for conversion. That once we, you know, hear the gospel and respond to it, that that's it. But really what we find in the life of a believer is that we have to preach the gospel to ourselves each and every day. The good news that uh, Christ came, Christ died, uh, Christ rose again, and that he, he will come back one day in power and glory. That that is something that we need to be reminded of each and every day. Now, I confess that the message today was going to be something uh, that we oftentimes talk a lot about, uh, that I think a lot of us have an idea about. We talk about uh, things called ordinances or practices. What do we do as a church? Uh, the church without walls, what does the church practice? And so uh, the title was kind of weird things. The church does some weird things. And so we're going to focus on uh, communion and baptism and, um, you know, what, is that, what does that look like? What, is that, um, what does it mean when we do that? And so, um, to a watching world, when we would, you know, when they, when they view those types of things, it seems a little bit odd, right? You know, you, you, you dunk under water and you, you drink some juice and, and eat some bread, and, and what does that all mean? But 
for whatever reason, I don't know if it was the news cycle or uh, God was just laying something different on my heart, um, as I began to write this message, I kind of steered in a bit different direction. And I think um, a lot of things kind of play into this, but I want to go ahead and give you the big idea right away. Uh, Here's my big idea. The church does weird things in the name of faithful consistency to Scripture. I want to say that again. The church does weird things in the name of faithful consistency to Scripture. Now, I want to make a statement, and then I want to ask a question. And here's, here's the statement, okay? Most of us are willing to go to church, to take communion, to be baptized, etc. Most of us are willing to do this because, at worst, we are seen as a little odd and a little quirky by society. Here's the question that I have from you, for you, sorry. Apart from our practices, are we willing to be faithful to Scripture outside these walls? Are we willing to do weird stuff and stand for positions the world sees as odd, as weird, even when it costs us something? Are we willing to do that as people? Now, as I mentioned, uh, I I changed this message a little bit. Some of it had to do with kind of where I'm at personally. Some of it had to do with, I think, the news cycle. Um, Nearly all of you would be familiar at this point with the name of George Floyd uh, to some degree whether you've heard about it in the, in the news or heard from it from other people. Uh, but the, the story of George Floyd is uh, a man in the U.S. who died uh, in police custody. Uh, and a police officer uh, arrested him and knelt on his neck for some 10 minutes. And the result of that was that uh, he lost his life. He could no longer breathe and um, he died. And so there's been a lot of outrage in the States about that. There's been a lot of outrage around the world about that particular uh, action. And people are right to be outraged. Um, If if you've seen uh, the footage of the protests, you you see how passionate people are. And even here in Auckland, there was a demonstration in solidarity with him. There's something in all of us, there's something uh, in us if we are a human being that understands that uh, we can't treat people that way. That even if we can't articulate it, even if we have no faith uh, basis, it is wrong for us to treat people in such a way that he was treated. And though every human being is cursed by the fall, and though every human being uh, has original sin, every human being also has an imprint of the divine. We are bearers of the living God. We bear his image. And so we know that implicitly that it's wrong to put your knee on someone's neck and treat an image bearer of the living God that way. And so here's what I kept coming back to in the scriptures. What are we called to do as people inside these walls or outside these walls? What does Jesus demand from us? And I came to Matthew chapter 22, the two great commandments that a lot of you would be familiar with. And I want to read those for us. Matthew chapter 22 says this, verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now certainly what happened to George Floyd was not loving your neighbor as yourself. Now as a church, in the last couple months, we have had some unique opportunities. Uh, We've had some opportunities for us to lead with Uh, the issue that we find ourselves in with coronavirus, with the way that we've been doing things a bit differently, Uh, certainly this issue of racism and reconciliation. There's a perfect opportunity for us in this situation and in other situations to lead. But I hope that what you get from this is that the church leads in a very specific way. And by comparison, I hope you'll see what I mean. 
Here's another question for you. If George Floyd had lived, would the officer's actions be seen as different? Now, of course they would. They would be by most people. If George Floyd had lived, things would have been different for that officer and for George Floyd. But if treating someone that way is not neighborly and not treating someone like an image bearer of the living God, then treating that person that way is the same whether or not the consequence is what it was. See, as a church, we need to stand for moral and biblical consequences even when the action doesn't draw attention. Even when the consequences are not bigger than wronging an image bearer of the living God. You know, the world is in a state of moral outrage, and rightly so. But we should see what happens to outrage when it is untethered to the grace of God. We see protests. We see demonstrations. We know that things are not as they, sh- as they should be, and so we shout, and we march, and we demand change. We know that things should be different, and yet we as the church have the inside story as to why things are not different and why they should be different, and one day how they will be different. Yet instead of proclaiming that to a hurting world and shouting grace and mercy from the rooftops, the church oftentimes gets pulled in a different direction. Now, some Christians are more prone to things like activism and marching and are drawn into these things. And I don't think protesting or shouting or or silently kneeling or any of those things, I don't think there's anything wrong with those things. But I don't think it sets us apart as God's people. Solidarity without hope isn't any help at all. It doesn't give us a platform. It isn't something that sets us apart. We should be shouting from the rooftops that every tribe, every tongue, every nation finds its hope in God alone. Now, I think the solution to this is going to be found in the next part of this message. This is really a tale of two messages. And and I don't think that anything that I've said thus far would be shocking to many people. I hope many of you are saying, amen, we should stand for justice, we should stand for righteousness, we should stand for mercy. And I hope many of you will be saying that when I'm finished. And I say that because I want to challenge you as a church, I want to challenge myself. The stakes are simply too high. And so here's what I want to ask you, are you following Jesus with all of your heart? Are you faithfully following Christ in all things? even when it's unfashionable. You know, experience has taught me that uh, we're often quite content to proclaim the name of Christ in matters of social justice and other things, because really, who isn't for social justice, right? It's the people versus a rigged system. It's the spirit of the times, and you would be hard-pressed to find anyone against the idea of justice for all. Now, their actions might speak a different tale, but if you were to ask someone if they were for justice for all, certainly most people would say yes. Now, Jesus was a revolutionary, and so the idea of standing for the marginalized and the oppressed is a really good thing. It makes us feel like we are on the side of good. On top of that, right now, society demands that from us. It's easy to be for those things. And I'm glad about that. It's easy to stand for justice to the oppressed. It's easy to stand for justice for women. I mean, who doesn't think that women deserve equal rights and privileges? Those are two very good things that society has come to a position. And we are right to celebrate that because it's part of the gospel. But what about consistency to Scripture when society doesn't demand it? What about setting ourselves apart when it's hard or thankless? What about consistency to Scripture when, in fact, society says that we should do the exact opposite? Now, what about a worldview that says injustice should be attacked regardless of whether it's culturally in? What about a worldview that says all life is precious, no matter how small or new or where? 
How about a worldview that says that the proper expression of sexuality is within marriage? Now, how many of us neglect the commands of Christ until we're smacked in the face with them? Now, I'm afraid that there are some Christians who are protesting unjust treatment, who are protesting the death of George Floyd because it's sinful and unjust and they should. But I want us to see that the same people that sometimes protest those things quite loudly in the name of Christ are willing to relax other commandments because they seem harsh or unfair or old school or hateful, part of some ancient caveman patriarchy or against the zeitgeist or whatever the reason might be. We're oftentimes eager to adopt the ethics of Jesus without following his commands. We forget that he came in love, but he will one day return in power and in glory. And love does win, but not in some universalistic, it will be fine for all way. Friends, my burden for the church today is that we are all in. That is the way for us to be the church outside these walls, is to be all in to the commands of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking about getting some things wrong theologically. We will all get things wrong theologically. None of us have the market cornered on theology, and none of us has perfect theology and belief. Nor am I talking about simple rule following. But as a church, we need to be reminded of the stakes, and the stakes here are ultimate. There is a seriousness with which we should be approaching life as the people of God. There is a heaven, and there is a hell, and there will be judgment, and there will be wrath, and there will be all those things that we oftentimes don't talk about, but there will also be undeserved grace and mercy, more than you can possibly imagine. We are God's people, and this collection right here of 66 books shows us how we are to relate to God, how God relates to us, and what he wants for us as people. Never forget that God is for you and that his word is a gift and that he has given it to us to encourage us, to equip us, that we we might hide it in our heart so that we might not sin against him, that we may know his will, that we may know what he wants for us as people and as a church. So it's said that the ones who will be separated from God are the ones who chose their own way, who refused to understand who they are as revealed in Scripture, to understand that they refuse to understand who God is as revealed in Scripture. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said, you know, thy will will be done, will be said by either God or man. We will either say to God, thy will be done, and follow him and his commandments and enter into his kingdom. Or he will say to us, thy will be done, and we will enter into eternal separation from him. I don't want us to be people in the church who pick and choose how to follow God, who stand for Christ when it's fashionable, when the spirit of the times, when culture is on our side. People who decide to follow the ethics of Jesus without really following his teaching and what he said. People who are unwilling to submit to all that he commands. There's something called the Jefferson Bible, which is uh, one of the founding fathers of the U.S. was a a man named Thomas Jefferson. And and so he went through the Bible and uh, all of the teachings that he didn't agree with or that he didn't like, he cut out. And so the Jefferson Bible is this sort of weird mix of things in Scripture that he approved of, and there are massive portions that are missing. And while we wouldn't likely cut up a Bible, we oftentimes ignore large parts of the Bible, especially the parts that are uncomfortable. And so as people outside these walls, let's not create a religion with Jesus at the center without actually knowing who Jesus is. And Jesus speaks to us clearly in the scriptures about this. 
He says that there are people who will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this? Didn't I heal people? Didn't I do miracles in your name? He's talking to people in the church who claim to be followers and who claim to be spreading his mission, and he will say to some of them, depart from me, I never knew you. So as we think about church outside these walls, let's think about who we are as people and whether or not we are willing to submit ourselves to all the commands of Christ. See, Jesus warns us that if we don't do that, that there will be consequences for us. And when we say things like we're willing to follow these parts of Scripture but not these parts of Scripture because it doesn't seem loving or it doesn't seem just or I can't believe that God would have us behave that way or feel that way, then what we're saying is we really don't trust in Him for our ultimate good. Now, some of you might be saying, wow, that's incredibly cynical. But I hope actually that what you see from that and what we'll get to in a minute, is that there's a lot of hope in the commands of Scripture. So then again, how should the church lead in a situation like what we've talked about, with oppression, with racism, with injustice? How do we lead in times of pandemics and social unrest? How are we faithfully consistent to do weird things and have weird positions even when society doesn't agree with it? Now, personally, I don't think Jesus would be among the mobs with the megaphones protesting, but maybe he would have been. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that. But what if we as the church, instead of patting ourselves on the back for standing for things that everyone stands for, what if we actually got stuck in as a church and as people? Let's use the example of the church in the U.S. What if the church in the U.S. actually got involved? What if the church in the U.S. wasn't afraid to ask the hard questions? Like, why are the vast majority of police forces overwhelmingly white while the vast majority of those arrested and incarcerated are overwhelmingly black? Why are the vast majority of African-American children born out of wedlock and raised by a mother or grandmother? Those are important social questions, and there's not a simple answer to this, but the hard truth is that the gospel is the only cure for racism and injustice, and those things will not be fixed until Jesus comes back. So in the meantime, what can we do as a church? What could the church in the U.S. do? Well, the church could open its doors. The church could welcome in people. The men in the church could mentor young boys and provide some stability The inherent worth of people could be expressed in all of the things that we do, in the way that we gather, in the way that we communicate with one another, in the way that we talk to people. See, instead of thinking that we'll stand with the crowd, what if we did something different? A preacher that uh, I once heard said this, do for the one what you wish you could do for everyone. Do for the one what you wish you could do for everyone. What if the church educated itself on the heart of God, the heart heart that he has for the marginalized and the oppressed? What if we got to know people? What if we took seriously the idea that Jesus didn't march against Rome, but he spent time with groups of people, weird people, marginalized people, different people, minorities, people who were not of the elite status in society? What if we took seriously the commands that Jesus saw all people the same. Now, though it seems bad to us today, racism today pales in comparison to how Jews and Romans felt about each other. Now, imagine the shock when Jesus said that Gentiles were grafted into the kingdom. Can you imagine how that must have felt to the Jewish people, the chosen people? people. Imagine the shock that the gospel is both for the old white racist woman and the young angry black male, both the same, both sinful and in need of God's grace. The power of the gospel is in really knowing someone. The power of the gospel is 
is in calling people to something greater than themselves, greater than their ethics or their idea of love or their idea of who Jesus is. The power of the gospel is demonstrated in obedience to the commands of God because of the promises that await us. That's our only hope. Marching can't change hearts. Laws can't change hearts. Social pressure cannot change hearts. Nothing but the gospel of Jesus Christ can bring change. Our common ground, and sometimes our only common ground, is Jesus. So as the church outside these walls, we should be pointing to him in all things. And one of the, one of the fears that I have both for myself and for the church and for all of us, is that I don't want to lose our saltiness. I don't want to lose our light. I don't want to shade it. The world doesn't need more marginalized clubs of strange people. The world needs people of love who stand for unpopular truths, who have different priorities. What if the world asked, why do you care about people so much that you've never met? Why do you care about people so far away? Or how can you reject someone's actions or their lifestyle and yet still love them and call them a friend? I don't, I don't get it. Those are the questions that we want the world to ask about us as followers of Christ. Now I mentioned that the stakes are quite high for us. And I wonder if we need to again be reminded of that because the game that some of us are playing and the game that actually is are different things. And all of us are engaged in this and playing a version of this. Some of us are playing a game that says Jesus is Lord and Savior and we will say that. But nothing in our lives apart from church attendance and apart from maybe a few other things actually says that. Nothing in the way that we approach other aspects of our life. Jesus is simply not a consideration in our finances or in our sexuality or our entertainment or our politics or the way that we spend our time. All of it looks just like the world. Some of us are playing that game. Others of us take the commands of Jesus seriously, at least some of them. And our picture of Jesus is generally the the countercultural, love-obsessed writer of all things. And you're not wrong to have this viewpoint, but it's simply one that is incomplete. The picture of Jesus loving the unlovable appeals, but the picture of Jesus as judge is simply too distasteful. After all, when we look at people in the world, they seem so nice, they bear fruit. Surely God overlooks that. And I'd rather spend time with some of those people than any other Christians that I know. The idea that a loving God would send anyone to hell for rebellion is simply too awful to contemplate. And so, therefore, some things in the Bible are better left alone. Can't we all just get along? Who am I to judge? After all, maybe the Bible doesn't really mean those things. Hyperbole, surely, when Jesus says something like, It's better to cut it off than to be separated forever. The act, certainly, hyperbole, the seriousness with which we should approach sin and obedience, deadly accurate. There's a third group that believe that Jesus demands our obedience in all things, and I fear that this is the smallest element of the global church, the group that sold out to living all the commands of Jesus, however imperfectly, in all things. Now, you need to hear this. Jesus does not judge the perfection of our obedience. That was settled on the cross long ago. But the zeal with which we approach obedience confirms that we are his. So for us as a church outside these walls, the stakes are simply too high. They're too high to say that we follow Jesus, but we don't act like it. Much too high to say that we like some of what Jesus stands for, but not everything. There's some tricky cultural things that demand some reinterpretation. Church, taking up your cross is costly. It hurts. It will seem unfair, and we won't understand things. We're constantly seduced by the world. 
We want to be on the right side of history. We don't want to stand for hard things because we're afraid of what that will mean in the eyes of others. We're tempted to remove Jesus from the God of the Old Testament because it seems so far away from us. Our minds just don't get it. But please don't do that. Because God never rejects the prayer of those who say, I don't understand. God never rejects the prayer of those who want to understand how to live more faithfully. Who want to understand the commands of Jesus and have the grace to follow them even when they're hard. But I fear that what God does reject is the arrogance of those who reinterpret and refuse to submit their lives to him because it just seems like too much to give up. But I want to encourage you, and I want you to take this away. The faithfulness of Scripture is something that we need to pay careful attention to. But if you are a struggling pilgrim, as we all are, and certainly I am, take heart, you're in good company. We don't always respond to things that we should. We won't perfectly live the commands of Jesus. It's impossible for us to do that. That's why Christianity is a religion of grace and mercy. See, God solved the problem that we could not. God himself bore the penalty that he required. We don't have to store up some, you know, goodwill and maybe he'll let us slip in the back door. That's not how this works. But I want you to also know that the Bible is serious. The commands of Jesus are serious. And that we need to, as people, strive to do our best to follow them. You won't always do that. So please don't feel beat down. But equally, please know that Jesus demands everything from us. That a cut and paste faith simply will not do. A faith that proclaims the name of Jesus without being willing to follow him makes no sense and in the end will ultimately lead to death. The fear of the Lord is good because if we allow us, if we allow it, it sends us directly into the arms of God. And we can experience his perfect love which casts out fear. So take heart. If you want to follow the commands of Jesus and you fill in yourself a desire to continue to do that, that is evidence that he is already working in you. Take heart, be patient, and be open. So how do we do that? How do we follow the commands of Jesus? Well, here's a couple just quick tips, and I hate to just add these on to the end of something, uh, but I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know. This is nothing new. We need to know what Jesus actually says. Read your Bible and get some help. Don't confuse shellfish and sexuality. And what I mean by that is don't confuse Old Testament purification laws with timeless moral standards. Don't confuse some commands of Israel for Israel with commands that Jesus has for us today. Jesus sets the bar higher, not lower, in the New Testament. And sometimes when we read the Bible that way, we read the Bible like the world reads it. You know, we pick and choose and say, well, what about this? And this isn't consistent. And how about this? And... We need to be careful about doing that because it mocks the Word of God. It's simply one more tired tactic. So if you want to understand the Word of God, if you want to understand the commands of Jesus, pray, get help, read good books, talk to trusted smart people, pay attention to to tradition, read it together. It's, It's not easy to understand sometimes, but it's worth it. And it's what God requires of us. And we can understand that the denial of something for our own good and an encouragement of us is for greater things ahead. The church does do some weird things. We practice weird traditions and ordinances, but the weirdest thing we do is that we believe that this collection of 66 books is the very words of God. We stand on all it says and we believe that it gives us everything we need for life. We don't believe it's a science textbook or that it covers every possible contingency that we might encounter. 
but we do believe that it gives us a specific picture of the character of God, the heart of God, that we can understand who he is and how he relates to us and how we are to relate to him. And that's what he requires of us. That's what Jesus requires of us. That's why when he calls us to be his disciples, he says, pick up your cross, that you need to walk as he walked. And that's not going to be an easy journey. And we'll lose heart if we don't know what the word of God says. If we don't know what the commands of Jesus are, it will be easy for us to lose heart. So let's not do that as people. Romans 12 talks about not being conformed to the pattern of this world, but being transformed by the renewal of our mind. And the main way that happens is through consuming Scripture. And so let's be people who stand for injustice, but let's also be people who stand consistently for the Word of God. Let that be why we're weird, because we have a faithful position to Scripture when it makes sense and when it doesn't, when the world says that's great, when the world says I don't like that. That more than anything else will convince a skeptical world of the power of the gospel to change lives. So would you pray with me and then uh, in just a few moments if, if you're prepared in your, in your group, you're going to take communion uh, together as a group. So let me, um, let me just pray for us and for uh, the time that you will have after this, this message. Father, I thank you for I thank you for your word. I thank you for the commands of Scripture. I thank you that Jesus promises that his burden is light, his yoke is easy. I pray that you would give us the desire to follow the teachings of Jesus, even when they're hard. That you would give us grace to do what we cannot do for ourselves. that you alone would be our source of strength. That as we stand against things in this world, that you would encourage us and equip us, that we will be set apart as people, not just for what we stand for, but the way in which we stand for it, the way in which we love others. And I thank you for the remembrance of the body and blood of Jesus Christ shed for our sins so that we could have new life. Let us remember that every tribe, every tongue, every nation, black, white, every other color, that you love and you desire for us to be one big family united under the grace of God and under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, that you will just encourage us in this. That we will again be confronted with the seriousness of of this life, but also with the incredible grace and mercy that you give us to live it. And so, Father, we give all these things to you and ask these in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So I want to encourage you today to maybe spend some time in discussion. If, if you're um, ready to take communion, please do that. Um, spend some time in prayer. Uh, spend some time with one another. Uh, I want you to be encouraged through this series. Uh, we'll, we'll continue this two more weeks. Uh, and hopefully you, you get a good picture of who we are as a church and uh, some of the things that we can focus on, whether we're inside this building or outside this building. Uh, the church is, is really God's people together and what they do. And so... Um, Be encouraged in that. Have a great week, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in this space, hopefully. We'll give you confirmation on that this week, but in this space next week. So have a great week. Bye.